very great pleasure to have been asked by uh, Ada and Clax to uh, chair the third and final panel of the day. And uh, what I would just like to do is take, to, before I uh, uh, introduce our illustrious speakers, I would just like to say that, uh, like Arlene uh, mentioned, who had to leave, but, you know, and, and Harvey just uh, told me as well, that many of us as graduate students use the RISM archive materials and spent, you know, probably in collective time thousands of hours, uh, although I should pretend that I got through graduate school faster than that. <laughs> but in any case, a lot of time uh, enjoying and profiting, profiting from this, this amazing collection that's now here at NYU, whether the secondary sources in themselves were priceless because they were hard to get, and the primary sources, well, it speaks for itself. And um, I was uh, just want to give a little bit of a shout out in, in absentia, uh, act as proxy to the wonderful librarian staff uh, and other people who worked at RISM when it was still on 78th and Lex. And, um, uh, and also to Emlyn Brown, who's not here, but who's the librarian archivist extraordinaire, who published with Jorge uh, a really interesting uh, essay. But uh, uh, Emlyn, uh, I worked with her for a summer, and she worked for years getting this archive, archived and, uh, and processed to bring over to um, uh, NYU. Uh, and so we, uh, many of us here have a long, long history uh, with RISM, which is a real treat. Uh, first, uh, uh, in, in, no, uh, in, in order of going, uh, let's see, my left to right, uh, I'd like to first uh, uh, introduce you to our first speaker, uh, Harvey Neptune. Now, uh, Harvey is an associate professor of history at uh, Temple University in the Department of History. And uh, Harvey was trained at NYU and is a student of our very own Ada Ferrer. For, former student, excuse me, I'm sorry, but I always think of myself as the st always the student, but I, yeah, former student, you know, g gone on on his own. <laughs> only student? Only, only. Oh, always, yes, always did. Yes, absolutely, that's how I think of it. And my advisor is actually no longer with us, Eric Wolf, and I feel like I'm always in some way his student. And of course, Professor Mintz, uh, who I've been mentored with for decades, uh, mentored by for decades. Um, so we're always students of. But in any case, let me move on. Um, uh, uh, at the moment, um, uh, Professor Neptune has published work concerned broadly with the cultural politics of decolonization in the British Caribbean, including his 2007 really very good book, Caliban and the Yankees, Trinidad and the U.S. Occupation. His current research involves, among other things, a northward adventure into U.S. historiography to argue for the presence in that field of an as yet unrecognized post-war variant of post-colonial history. And uh, I would also like to introduce Professor Don Robotham, who is a professor of anthropology at the Graduate School at the City University of New York. Uh, Professor Robotham did his undergraduate degree at the University of the West Indies, and I'm going to guess Mona, since there are more than one, right? So I think it must be Mona. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that later. And in sociology, uh, and his PhD in anthropology at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, Don has done field work in Ghana, Guyana, and Jamaica, and is the author of several books, including Struggles of the Jamaican People uh, with Trevor Monroe, and also uh, uh, just a couple of others for now, Militants or Proletarians, the Economic Culture of Gold Miners in Southern Ghana, and uh, Culture, Society, and Economy, Bringing Production Back In. Uh, uh, in uh, 2005, as well as m you know, new, many, 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 many scholarly articles on Ghana and the English-speaking Caribbean. Uh, and I um, uh, would like to add that uh, in 1995, he was appointed by the Honorable Prime Minister of Jamaica to chair the committee which reestablished a national youth service system in Jamaica, which is really important. His research interests are in the areas of development, economic anthropology, crime and social theory. And he's currently working on a comparative study of the conditions of youth in Jamaica and Ghana. Now, uh, our speakers, because we have two, we have a little more latitude for time, but we do want to have a, a very vibrant Q&A. So they'll each be speaking for about 20 minutes. 
and, uh, uh, and then we will proceed from there. So I'm not sure who would like to go on first. Did you guys flip a coin? or uh, uh, Well, let's have uh, Professor Robotham, if you wouldn't mind, step up uh, and help me welcome him. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let me first of all thank the organizers of uh, the symposium for inviting me, which I highly appreciate, and also thank the audience who are going to have to endure <laughs> my presentation. The uh, issues in the studies of the English-speaking Caribbean presented in the work of Viva Rubin is uh, they're fascinating issues. But before I get into them a bit, I want to, I, I just came back from West Africa with my wife and, and so on, and uh, we were in Ghana and doing the thing and so on. We've been several times. And of course, we went to the slave force like everybody, or like many people do. And uh, it was a really powerful experience, so much so that we had to terminate it because not only ourselves, but others, uh, for example, there's a group from South Korea who just refused to go on. There's a group from Nigeria, very, very interesting, who absolutely said they're not going any further. And uh, there's a group from Eastern Europe, too, who took this position. It was really an intriguing event in its own right. First of all, both the heterogeneity of the people who are doing this tour, as well as the, the depth of the reaction to the events. And, uh, one, th one of the things which I think upset certainly uh, my side and the people from Nigeria was the sort of uh, delicate way in which a Ghanaian guide danced around uh, African responsibility for the slave trade. And that, frankly, uh, led to a bit of an outburst and a, a minor incident of sorts. But I say that, by the way, because every time I go to... Um, West Africa, and especially Ghana, which I've been going to for years, the deep similarities between West Africa and the so-called English-speaking Caribbean, which is really the Afro-Caribbean, uh, really, uh, becomes so apparent and so obvious in a wide range of things. Uh, this is particularly so in eastern Nigeria and in Ghana. And we can, I, I don't want to go into it in greater detail, but I'm certainly happy to discuss this. And this is something which has always inspired my work. It has nothing to do with Herskovitz, God bless his soul. Uh, but it has to do with simply with certain realities which are absolutely observable and does not need great erudition to perceive. So with that in mind, let us press on to discuss some of the features of the contemporary Caribbean in the work of Viva Rubin and the issues which it raises for the realities today. There are two things in Vera Rubin's work which I would start out by stressing, uh, which I think are of very great importance for anthropology and indeed for all scholars of, uh, of the Caribbean and indeed all scholars of the developing world located in the metropole. The first thing was Vera Rubin's uh, determination to be sure that she interacted with the local intelligentsia. This is really, really important. It's a hallmark of her work. Uh, far too often, uh, uh, the, the anthropologists from North America or Europe leaps over the local intelligentsia and bonds with his, his or her village. And of course, uh, this is extreme. And then, and then, most hilarious of all, proceeds to agonize about multivocality and reflexivity. Uh, when staring the person in the face, right, is a powerful and active intelligentsia, which of course is ignored and bypassed. Vera Rubin did not practice this, quite the contrary. She formed deep and enduring bonds with the indigenous intelligentsia in the Caribbean, which had its own history, had its own intellectual outlook, and so on. And this is really, really important because, again, coming back to the African experience, one of the things which people, f uh, which is important to understand, is that there are almost no anthropology departments in independent sub Saharan Africa. It's, it's forbidden. The contempt in which this discipline is held is something which has to be experienced to be believed, right? 
No, there are anthropologists around, for sure, right? But, uh, and, and the discipline somehow proceeds. But, and of course, in South Africa, which is predominantly a white uh, phenomenon in South Africa, in terms of the average black African intellectual, this is an extremely dubious intellectual exercise. The other thing about Vera Rubin, which is important here, is that not only did she interact with the local intelligentsia, uh, but she also threw resources at it. Again, this is really important. And the fact that NYU is sharing its RISM collection with University of West Indies is, ex is really, really something commendable. And it's the kind of thing which we should emulate and look for other ways in which uh, to participate in that kind of activity. Because at the end of the day, one has to have a partnership with the intellectuals across communities if any meaningful discourse is to take place. And Vera Rubin certainly set very high standards in this area, which a lot of us should try to emulate. I want to make some comments on her study, which is the one which is the subject of the panel, which is a study which she did in 57 and 61, and to relate it to certain characteristics of the Caribbean today. This study was a study of a, a sample survey, very interesting, of a thousand students in uh, fifth and sixth form, which would be what, um, 12th and 13th grade, yeah, I guess, in the North American system, in sort of elite high schools, more or less, uh, in, the English, in Trinidad and Tobago. And she did this first survey in 57. It was a survey of attitudes to race and class and uh, attitudes to the impending political independence. And she repeated it on a smaller scale in 61. And it's an intriguing study, and it raises a lot of issues, some of which I, I, I want to comment on. The first thing that strikes you in the study is what I call Vera Rubin's methodological pragmatism. I mean, I mean, you could say that this is a defect, and you know, from a purist point of view, I suppose it is, but who cares? Uh, the point here is that Vera Rubin's scholarship is not the type, not the type of anthropologist who agonizes about being an anthropologist, and what is anthropology, and am I being an anthropologist, and how does that, there is none of this in her work, as, I, as I've experienced it. Vera Rubin used whatever methods applied to the problem of hand. If history was important, she used history. If sociological analysis was, was appropriate, she used that, so that there is, Driving her intellectual work is something which I admire greatly, which is this putting of the problem before the craft presuppositions of the discipline. So that this is a woman whose work is driven by the problems at hand rather than by any assumption of the methodological requirement of a particular discipline. Now, the downside of that is obvious that um, you know, it is eclectic. It is theoretically very eclectic. Uh, some would say th theoretically very defective, and undoubtedly it may be said so. But at the same time, what leaps out at you is a lot of what contemporary anthropology lacks, which is its ability to address some of the burning problems of the day which are meaningful to the people in the societies, so that her anthropology has an audience which is not simply North American, and that is precisely because she did not define her perspective in narrow medieval craft terms. Now, in that study which she did, she depicted an interesting society, a, a, a society which uh, we should ponder, answer whether the term modernity is the appropriate one to capture its characteristics. Maybe it is, but perhaps it is not. Who is to tell? She presents a picture of Trinidad in the social survey as a society which is deeply fragmented and divided. The young students of Indian descent have powerful stereotypes against the young students of African descent. Within the group which is of Indian descent, there are deep inner conflicts between different groups, rural and urban. There are deep conflicts which have to do with uh, who is Muslim and who is Hindu and who is Christian. 
she depicts a situation where the old white elite, the students of the old, fascinating old white elite, feel alienated and marginalized and have no place in this Trinidad Caribbean society which is developing. She depicts a population of African descent which is hostile to the population of Indian descent, deeply hostile. These are young people who are sort of 14, 15, 16. And she's looking at what this is telling us about the prospects of this country soon to be independent. And in fact, about the characteristics of Caribbean society. The population of African descent is not only hostile to the population of Indian descent, it is internally deeply fragmented and divided along lines of color and class. And she presents this picture of a society which is, has a long history of oppression, which has deep social and cultural and political divisions, and at the end of the day, whose stability is profoundly questionable. And the, the conclusion of her, of, her, uh, of her article is a kind of question mark in which she says, well, there are all these politicians who are on the scene who have all of these high nationalist ideals and democracy and political independence and development and God knows what, right? But the question is, what will the reality be? And what will the gap between these highfalutin ideals and the actual concrete reality of Trinidadian society be closed? And you can interpret this as a sort of cautious pessimism, or if you will, Cautious optimism, but cautious it certainly is. The question is, uh, how has this analysis of Viva Rubens played out, and how effective do we regard it today, and what does it tell us about the character of this thing called Caribbean society? Again, it puts on the table squarely as to how should we characterize this society, conceptually speaking, is it adequate to regard this society, and I come back to this point, as in some sense modern? And what does this vague, amorphous, and some say meaningless term, modernity, actually specify in any concrete, meaningful, and useful way? Right? It seems to me that it's far more useful to get to the concrete realities of the Caribbean, which societies formed by colonial forms of capitalism, deeply steeped in forms of racial oppression with a deep history of slavery and other forms of acute oppression, and also, on the other hand, with a powerful tradition of fighting against that, that system of oppression and trying to find ways through it, over it, under it, above it, and around it. And it, the, the fact of the peculiarity of this kind of complex is that because these islands are small, I mean, population of Barbados, quarter million people. Jamaica, which is big, is 2.8 million people. Cuba, which is you know, maybe 12 million people, perhaps, and so on. Uh, because these places are small, the particular antagonisms generated by this horrible combination of plantation and colonial capitalism and modern neoliberal society creates an intensity of antagonism which frequently explodes. Explodes not only politically, but of course, as is well known, also explodes in music and in song. Now, this picture which Vera Rubin paints, I think, has many strengths, as I, as I um, you can discuss it afterwards a bit, but also has some problems. And uh, two of the problems I think I would point to have to do with what I would call, meaning no offense, um, it's liberalism. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, let me give you an example, a practical example of what I mean. They, sorry, this, these studies were done 57 and 61. And I was, it, it led me to reflect on where I was in 57 and 61. Of course, I was in high school in one of these fifth, stupid fifth forms and sixth forms being survived, surveyed by some North American anthropologists, uh, uh, myself, and so on. Um, but, but of course, in 59, there was an explosion of no mean order in the Caribbean, 90 miles away at a place one could see from Jamaica, which absolutely shook our intellectual and political life to its very foundation. 
This, of course, is Cuban Revolution. Right? And the powerful effect of this thing in Latin America as well, but in the Caribbean, is indescribable. To us who were in high school at the time, on the eve of political independence, we asked ourselves, if these wretched people, we could see them across the seas from points in Jamaica, could be so daring about their society and take it by the scruff of its neck and try to shake it and change it, then what the difference was wrong with us? Why were we so passive? And the Cuban Revolution, of course, had this powerful effect of actually generating an enormous current of left uh, political, intellectual, cultural activity, part of whose expression ultimately is the music of Mali and so on, which people celebrate in, in a certain sense today. Yet Vera's Rubin study was done 57, 61. There is no sign whatsoever that this explosion has occurred. And this is, rem this is remarkable, actually. It's quite remarkable. Uh, and I say this not, you know, hindsight and blah, blah, blah. You can always shut any rubbish 40 years afterwards. God knows what people would say 40 years from now about what we are talking about today. Um, but, but the fact is, this is a significant omission, of, put it mildly. And I think it bespeaks a certain limitation, both in the intellectual apparatus of the North American anthropologists of that time, as well as in the political orientation of people. Now, uh, I don't want to go on and on, a few more minutes, I think, perhaps. Um, but I did want to say that in addition to this problem, and it's connected to it, of the, of the absence of any examination of deeper currents in the society, which would explode very f soon in other parts of the Caribbean. Uh, this, in a sense, is reflected in some of the issues which really grip the Caribbean youth population today, which I want to end on mentioning some of these things. These problems sp spring from what I call the collapse of the plantation economy in the, in, in the Caribbean throughout, right? from Cuba to through Jamaica, through uh, the smaller islands in the Eastern Caribbean, and so on, the sugar industry is kaput. Therefore, the sociological and ideal and cultural models of the society based upon the plantation paradigm have absolutely no use today. They are completely useless. They have no validity. Uh, the Chinese all own, the Chinese own what is left of the Jamaican sugar <laughs> industry, and they're rapidly computerizing it and transforming it beyond recognition. It's a shadow of what it used to, used to be. The Cuban sh sugar industry has contracted dramatically. I mean, it's, it's n n remotely what it used to be, say, 59, 60, 70, even 70s, and so on. And of course, in the other islands of the Caribbean, Trinidad in particular, uh, uh, this, this is gone. What has replaced it, of course, as we know, is tourism. Or what is trying to replace it is tourism. And this is really quite a, a phenomenon which is not analyzed carefully. I mean, there are many people sort of noting it and so on, but it's not a many sort of perhaps maybe you know, shallow or maybe not so shallow observations as a new, plant, new slavery, a new plantation, blah, 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 and so on and so forth, perhaps, perhaps not. Um, but, but the thing is, this is really striking and dramatic. You know, in a place like, uh, say, St. Lucia, the St. Lucia gets about five tourists for every one St. Lucian citizen. In Jamaica, it's about uh, maybe one tourist for every maybe 1.5, two Jamaicans, right? In Dominican Republic, it's about one tourist per about uh, maybe three Dominicans. In Cuba, I think it's about one to about six at the moment. But it's, it, the tourist industry in Cuba is growing at 8.5% per year now. I mean, in other words, very, very soon, that Cuban tourist sector is going to be not maybe not quite of St. Lucian ratios, but is going to be a huge force, if it not already is, in the dynamic and the structuring and the configuration of Cuban political economy and Cuban social life. So that uh, this collapse of the old plantation system and the attempt to 
provide a new basis for this society, these societies, these small you know, societies with this horrible history and so on, uh, in the tourism sector is the sort of what needs to be understood and what needs to be grasped. If one is really trying to grasp the Caribbean as it is, as opposed to some fictional cultural studies model of it. However, it is quite clear that this effort to develop a tourist foundation for these societies is in deep crisis and has extreme limitations. And the best expression of this is, in fact, the situation with youth unemployment. And this connects with uh, Vera Rubin's study. Because at, at the end of the day, even though Vera Rubin's study presents this fragmented, divided, and after you read it, it's like, God almighty, I mean, these people should just fold up their tent and forget it, <laughs> right? Uh, because this is not going anywhere. Uh, yet Trinidad continues and continues very prosperous in some respects. But what is, one of the features, the peculiarities of your Rubin's study is the peculiar optimism of the young people, which comes out in spite of this, which is, uh, in a sense, very Caribbean in a funny kind of way. Um, the house is falling, the house is on fire, everything is tumbling down, and you're, you know, you're grinning like whatever, and so on. But, 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 but the thing about it is that this optimism, which is present in the young people that Vera Rubin studied in 57 and 61 in their views, despite all of this stuff, this optimism is gone. It's gone. It's gone. And instead, what has replaced it is a powerful sort of post-colonial angst, a deep sense that the post-colonial project has failed and that the youth population has been left right, to fend for itself. And fend for itself it has principally in criminal activity. Now, the, ba the basis for this, I mean, the, I won't bore you with all the gory details of the unemployment data and all that stuff, but I just say this, that if you look at the labor force data in the English-speaking Caribbean up and down, and I think it's also the case for the Dominican Republic, probably Puerto Rico, I'm not sure, uh, and Cuba to be, I would say, right? What you find is that maybe about uh, youth unemployment, we're talking about 15, 29, that age group, youth unemployment is running mm, in the region of about 26, 27%, let's say, on the average. Uh, which means that female unemployment, youth unemployment is probably around 30, 33%, because it's always higher. But when you look at it more carefully, what you realize, if you look at unemployment in the poorest so-called poorest quintile, you know, the World Bank uses quintile analyses and so on, on all these labor force and poverty studies, divide things into quintiles and so on. If you look at unemployment in the poorest quintile, unemployment rises to 36, and in some cases, 41%, right? In addition, apart from the purely unemployed youth population, a very large and growing percentage of the youth population simply dropped out of the labor force altogether. In fact, the, po the population which is outside of the labor force, and therefore not, strictly speaking, unemployed, because they've abandoned that formal sector altogether, this population is usually about double the size of the strictly unemployed group. So what you have in, where the, the, pro the, the project which we were studying in 57 and 61 has landed, Right, is in this very deep and difficult crisis which faces the youth population of these places. And their response to it is a varied response. Uh, crime is a major part of it, unfortunately, and the homicide rates are, are phenomenal uh, in, the, in the Caribbean. The Virgin Islands is probably the highest homicide rate in the world. It's about 60 per 100,000. Uh, in Jamaica, it's about 52. In uh, Dominican Republic, it's about 40. You can contrast that to the United States, which is five per 100,000. Or Lebanon, which is 2.2 per 100,000. Uh, it is true, you can take comfort in the fact that El Salvador is 78 per 100,000. If that's co somebody's comfort, then so be it, right? But when you have mur murder rates which are pushing 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 
per 100,000, then it's obvious that these societies have developed uh, a deep inner crisis, which is turning in on itself. In, and this is perhaps where um, one, one, I, I will end on this. One of the things, one of the difficulties is that, because for various reasons we could discuss, the left project in the Caribbean has, should I say failed, or should I say stalled? I leave it to you to choose the appropriate term, right? Has not panned out, let us say, put it that way. Uh, therefore, there is no institutional channel for the grievances of young people to flow into in any organized political way. And therefore, they are on their own. And the drug trade coming through from Colombia, the islands are critical in this chain. And across Jamaica, St. Lucia, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Haiti, Barbados, every, St. Kitts, Nevis, right, every single one of these islands, young people have become sucked into this trade. And the consequences of this are the usual consequences of internecine violence, uh, black on black violence, bitter turf disputes, uh, horrendous killings from time to time, reprisals, attacks on members of the judiciary. All of this is going on while hundreds of thousands, <laughs> I don't know if this is funny or not, while millions of tourists are cruising through the region, happily enjoying the sun, sand, sex, and perhaps breeze. Who's to tell? Right? So, I want to stop here, and maybe we can discuss it. But the, the point I want to get back to is that what the Caribbean presents to us, and in fact, this is one of the reasons, perhaps the only reason why it's so interesting, is because what you have here is all, many of the contradictions of, of the world today concentrated in a particularly virulent form in, a, in tiny spaces. So they take on an intensity and have a frontal quality, which unfortunately is insufficiently captured in the work of Vera Rubin, important as her work undoubtedly is. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me begin by saying, well, let me just say hello. Hello, how is everyone? <laughs> Cool, let me begin by saying thanks. And I want to say a special thanks because this is one of those occasions when I really, okay, I'm not going to try playing with this. When, I'm, when I really want to take the opportunity to thank teachers. And so I'm going to, I'm going to get to Ada after, but there are some other important teachers here. Connie Sutton is here. Um, Antonio is here. He, I never had him in a class, but he's definitely a teacher. And I feel embarrassed to say that I only read his dissertation maybe about a month or five weeks ago, and he sent me pieces. So Antonio, I have, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say I'm a late student of yours, but um, thank you very much. Let me look around. I don't know if Sidney Mintz is here, but he just, he just left. But again, another important teacher of mine. And then there's Ada. <laughs> But you know when I say that so nicely, I'm going to say something bad now. So the only reason I'm here is because Ada asked me to be here, and she said it was going to be a workshop, I think. So I looked up workshop. <laughs> and the key to workshop, and it's like, I think I knew this when you said workshop, when I agreed, because the key to workshop, and I'm going to have to try to get the quote, is that it allows one to go without having to mind too much whether he is successful straight off. So I came here thinking, all right, I could say anything. <laughs> it's a workshop. And then I figured out a couple of days ago, God, it's a symposium. But I was saying to Aisha, I also looked up symposium. <laughs> Oxford English Dictionary. You think historians do, right? You get to words, and you immediately go to the Oxford English Dictionary, and I go to symposium. And one of the first definitions is about liveliness, conviviality, conversation, and drink. And I thought, <laughs> I'm good then. <laughs> I'll be here. Okay, so I'm here for the symposium, and um, again, the, the charge I think I had from Ada was to look at these records in a particular, I don't even want to say an archive, it's really an archive being made, right? In a sense, what I'm looking at is what was originally scholarly research done in the 1950s, collected by RISM, and now it's collected by NYU. So in a sense, I felt what my charge was was to make sense of something that initially was research scholarship, and now it's in the process of becoming primary resources. 
So I felt that my charge was, in a sense, to make sense of what this archive might look like. So I'll do, I'll do three things. And then what I realized, the three things I want to do might be oriented more, directed more toward students. Because in a sense, what I want you all to know is what you might do from these archives. So what I'll do is three things. I'll, in a sense, I guess you can call it annotate the archive. right? Just briefly, a kind of preliminary note, say what this thing was intended for. Um, and then I'll give a sense of maybe what we can do with it. So annotate, then interrogate. Right? We're going to ask, what can you do with this archive now? What kind of stuff, what kind of arguments might young historians here make, CLAC students who are looking for projects? And in a sense, I think it's almost like that. I'll urge students at least to think about a project very much similar to what Antonio did with the Puerto Rican project. I think there's a way that out of that archive, what I'm going to suggest is you can treat it as a study of this study. And even though when Antonio first started, someone told him it wasn't, <laughs> why, why are you doing that? I think it's clear that whatever. <laughs> Connie, was it you? <laughs> it's a good thing Antonio doesn't listen to Connie anyway, right? <laughs> so, but I think that's the kind of study I will suggest. And thirdly, um, the third question might be, it's third issues to demonstrate, right? So annotate, interrogate, demonstrate. And the demonstrate part is, well, what's in it? And so we have some slides. So I'll get to show eventually what's in the archive, and we can get to do that. In terms of the first part, which is describing what what's it, it's intended for, and maybe I should read just a bit to give a sense so I'll get to hit some key points. But what I really want to do there, in a sense, is to historicize it. Right? How did these documents appear when they first emerged? And there's a way that I'm playing on a pair, because I want to say, how did they appear? How did they come to be? But also, how did they seem to people? Right? How did they appear? What would this have meant? And so I'll just try to talk briefly about 1957, which is the moment of the making. And somewhere in the context of that, Don, and you're another teacher of mine that I didn't <laughs> mention, but I remember 1997 was the first time I met you. And Don, I'm going to say that somehow I might challenge your interpretation of Vera Rubin just a bit. But I think that's what good students are supposed to do in some way, right? Challenge their teachers. Okay, so I'll read a bit and then I'll talk. I'll, I'll say some things about 1957 and set the context up for these documents. This, by the way, what you're seeing is the dissertation that eventuated from the research done in 57. So Vera Rubin guided the research, but the principal name we'll deal with here is Zavaloni. So she was the, the person who did most of that research. Okay, for any archive to be of critical use, it must be itself understood not only as a producer of history, but as a product of history. So the point in this section then is to throw out a few comments as a note toward the history of these particular RISM records. I am aware, of course, that what future students do with this archive is literally unimaginable. Still, I will attempt in that historian's cliche to capture the contents of those Trinidad boxes in their contemporary early Cold War moment. The point in short is to inquire how this archive would have appeared. OK, so literally, what does it look like? I'm going to just try to describe a bit what the records are, then tell you where I came from. Literally, these documents consist, for the most part, of questionnaires and autobiographies. Now, I can even tell you something a bit about how it was done. So if you go through the Zavaloni study, she talks about the fact that the questionnaire is done in the afternoon, the autobiographical essay is done in the morning, and we could you know, talk about exactly how she gets the principles to put these students in a separate room, away from, again, so it raises all these questions. You get a day off to write an essay and do a questionnaire. What do you do with that? Right, so we begin to think about what they say in these essays and why they say it. So context, again, key. Um, the autobiographies and questionnaires were conducted with about, I think, so Don said 1,000, I saw about 800, but anywhere between 800 and 1,000 students from secondary schools across the island. Now what's in interesting about this is that she's clear that this only accounts, so only 8% of school age, secondary school age students are actually in school. Only 5% would have gotten to fifth form or sixth form. So there is a sense that there is a, so even on its own terms, there are questions about represent, 
representativeness of the sample. Um, there are over 27 boxes, by the way. I've only looked about maybe a nine or 10. But from all of these questionnaires, and I focused a lot on the questionnaires and looked at the questions they asked, there were certain kinds of questions being asked. And they were most oriented toward values. And the values, again, are intriguing. And I think what they tell us, and I'll beg to differ a bit with, with Don here, but it might be a major difference. And rather than, I think what they tell us primarily is how the researcher is defining the problem. So rather than necessarily maybe a methodological pragmatism that accepts the problem on the ground, these questions tell you in a way what, how the problems are being defined. Right, so people are being asked particular questions. And in a way, those questions are defining what the problems are. So it's questions, for instance, about how many children would you like to have? Now, what's really cool about this question is that they're asking, they ask two versions of it. How many questions do you expect, how many children do you expect to have? And then they ask, how many children would you like to have? Right, so there's a sense that the expectation, like, right, how many children would you like to have, that those, those things are different, which, and I'm, I'm not gonna put an interpretation on it because one of the things I wanna do is leave it open, right? You all will go in the archives. But those things to me at least raise questions. Like why do they have those two questions? Um, they asked questions like, what, what are name the two worst things that someone can say about you? Something like, what are the two worst things that someone can say about you? They ask about marriage, for instance, right? They ask both men and women, what kind of qualities do you look for in a partner? So it's, it's clear about, so family is crucial to them. They ask about values, about spending. What would you do if you had X amount of money? What kind of stuff would you do on it? And most important, I think it is most striking to me, they were asking about the future. And so that's why I think the title of this piece is crucial. And I think this notion of future is also something when you go to that archive to pay very close attention to, because I think it's, it's when we get to the second section, we'll see why this matters. But it tells you how they're defining the problem, and in a way the problem is future-oriented. Right, so this is what are these societies going to look like during independence. So outside of those, those questionnaires, and when you look at the answers that come up, they also tell us a lot of intriguing things. So like, for instance, who is your hero? You'd see Eric Williams for some people, and then you'll see Nat King Cole for others. So it gets to tell us again, what's the, what's the imagination of students at, at that point? But again, most, more intriguing to me than the questionnaires themselves is this other section. And this is one of the things that this research considered itself as pioneering for, which is the autobiography part. So besides the questionnaires, which were done in the evening, afternoon, there was an essay section. And the essay section was called Autobiography of the Future. And so all of these students were asked to write essays about what they think would happen. And the future has a, a bounded date, right? There, there, there's a horizon, 2080. And so one of the things that I might come back to at the end that we could talk about is what does this mean, that this is an archive of the future that is actually past to us, right? So this is like an archive of a future past, it's 2000. So we get to see what they thought would happen in 2000, we in 2012. So it's, it's, it's really intriguing to think about how people, how they imagine the future and how we might imagine this, their future is our past. Um, yes, I wanna say something maybe a bit that was personal about it because one of the things going through the secondary schools I was able, so, so, so they coded. You can tell what secondary school you went to, these essays are actually named. If you were really intrigued <laughs> to know about particular people in Trinidad, you could find out. But I went to my old high school. Right, so I went to those files, saw what people were saying in 1957, and like, I saw someone who could have been my dad, right? <laughs> Except that my dad didn't go to that school, but his, his goal, so his dream, he's like, what would you like, what do you hope to do? What's your great hope for the future? And he says, well, I have lots of great hopes, but the one that I think is most realizable is making the school football team. <laughs> football, right, so soccer in their mind. So he is all focused, he's like, this summer, I'm gonna work out, well not summer, they would call it the August holidays. He's like, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna make the football team. And 
I will play in the Intercal final, which is the football final, against Naparima College, which is another major school. Right? But then you get this, it's, it's so subversive because they're, you know, they're asking him, they're expecting him to write something about changing the world or politics, and he's like, football. <laughs> now, outside of football, the other things he mentions are also intriguing. He talks about cinema, right? So he wants to go to the movies and record collecting. And for me, that was a moment to say, step out from this now and think about 1957. So what I want to do next to put some context and even how this, these, not just so much the questionnaires, but how, what the answers tell us about that period. So to take a simple answer like cinema and record collecting, I just wanted to move out from the document itself and say what's happening in Trinidad at this moment. So 1957. A few things, so I'll just list, like you can take some notes and some dates to think about how to make sense of these answers. 1957, federation and independence, right? So that's, that's one key context. What's happening in that period? Well, 58 is when they would actually inaugurate, but in 57, it's already passed, right? So it's known that there'll be a federation. In 57, Chagaramas is already the capital, so it's this, this moment. Um, Ghana, 1957. Kitchener, Calypsonian is singing, London is a place for me, 1957. Uh, maybe most important for me, Alec War and Island in the Sun, that film, 1957. So even when Zavaloni and that entire crew Vera Rubin, and it's about eight or nine researchers. And for, in, in, intriguingly, when I was doing research on Ireland and the Sun, there was actually a report in Trinidad of these researchers being present. So people are aware that these researchers are here. So the very same summer that they are there, Ireland and the Sun is out. Ireland and the Sun leads us to Harry Belafonte, rock and roll star of Calypso, 1957. 1957, Harry Belafonte leads us to Eric Gary, right? Because Island in the Sun, the film, is based on a novel, and we know the novel is based on Eric Gary's life. Eric Gary Grenada takes us to M.G. Smith. Mm. I won't say much about M.G. Smith. Some people here can talk far more about M.G. Smith <laughs> than I can. Don, you're not even looking at me. <laughs> right. M.G. Smith and I have here, M.G. Smith and the pre-post-colonial pessimism of pluralism. So 1957, we should also think conceptually pluralism, right? This study then has to be understood. So there isn't this, there's culture, there's politics, and then there's academic theorizing. So we can't make sense of this outside Caribbean studies and pluralism. Neither can we think about it outside of sociology. And I would say in this context, the key term we might think about is the sociology of the marginal man. And I say that in a few ways. The marginal man is a concept that Archie Singham would use to talk about Eric Gary. But if you read the origins, it actually goes back to Robert Park and the Chicago School in 1928. And I think this, if you go back to really Robert Park's story, we get to see where I think the problem of this study is. Right, because we get to see how they're defining what the problem is within the Caribbean. So you know, the next section I want to go into is to say, all right, what, not just what was this intended for, but what can we get from it? How do we interrogate this? So in a sense, what I want to get to is some of the assumptions that in 1957 will make this questionnaire and autobiography, these, these autobiographical essays possible. So in other words, the way that Zavaloni and Rubin and they would define the problem in the Caribbean. And I think that is linked to a larger problem that to me is foundational for Caribbean studies. That in some ways I've been thinking about that. It's like as a student of the field, it's interesting because I almost want to like erase that entire past. It's like we have to, we have to go back to the 50s. So part of why I was happy to be invited is an opportunity to say Caribbean studies needs to be rethought fundamentally. Because what this tells us is that Caribbean studies was introduced as a problem. And the way they define the problem is and in, in some ways, we know it as family, right? We know that problem through the concept of the dysfunctional family. But in a sense, we get to see it as a problem that's fundamentally about self. And so this notion of a marginal person, of someone who is insecure, of 
individuals in a way who are not quite prepared for independence. So the youthfulness in the title that I was playing with was really saying that partly they're defining the, the Caribbean as young and doubtful. And you know, if, if this song's all abstract, once we get to, once I get to show you what Zavaloni actually says in this piece, it will become clearer the problematic way in which this is being defined. And I actually want to read one quick section. Okay. And so th this is how, and I wish Sydney Mintz had been here because partly this is how I titled it. The making, what we, what we get from this, what I think students might most be able to get from this archive is to understand the making of the Caribbean area as a third world area. Now, what I mean by that, and it links back to Don's question, what I mean by that is the Caribbean is being defined as questionably modern. Right? The modernity of the Caribbean is actually being questioned. So the Caribbean is being defined as this place that is struggling with the concept of with the historical process of modernization. Right? So in a way that, even when you ask about whether it's modern or not, if you go to Zavaloni's part, and I will show it, is that what Zavaloni is actually questioning is whether or not these societies, and she's using Trinidad as an example, whether it can successfully modernize, which explains, by the way, why the, the project actually focuses on youth. The very assumption is that the youth that she is interviewing would be the elites, right? So she's going to these especially prestigious high schools in order to look at what she sees as the next elite class. And so all of these questions are trying to interrogate the values of the elite class. And so when we look at the questionnaires, it's important to pay attention to those questionnaires because you get to see what it is they're trying to find out. And ultimately, right, ultimately they're trying to ask questions about self-esteem. Right, you go through the questionnaire, it's ultimately about whether these are not, whether these are complete in a way stable functional selves or are they marginal men? In other words, are they going to be Eric Gary? And so that's why we need to know something about Eric Gary in the 1950s. We get to see, in other words, what, what is defined as the problem for Caribbean studies, at least from the English Caribbean perspective. Right? So I think that's, that's crucial. So for, for Sid Mintz and why I come back to the third world, because what it really does is that the third world makes the Caribbean seem questionably modern, and then it, it makes it seem as though the contemporary modern of the 50s or 60s, that process of modernization, is something alien and troubling and disconcerting to Caribbean people. And I, so I think that's part of, and it's fundamental to the notion of the third world. Once you become placed in the third world, modernity is a problem. And the reason why I'm raising the Sid Mintz question is because I felt like his whole career, in a way, has been coming back to try to explain that, well, the Caribbean was always modern, right? From 1492, it was modern. So the question becomes, why didn't scholars see that? Why is it in the 50s and 60s the Caribbean has to be modernized? So part of the big, okay, so I, I hope people are following. This is an argument I've tried to make to friends. And like, what are you saying? <laughs> so I'm going to try to be slow about it, right? Once the problem is defined as modernization, it means the Caribbean is somehow not modern or less modern or on the way to modernity. And that, I'm arguing, is something that happens only in the 1950s. That's actually area studies raising that question. Eric William C.L.R. James had already pointed out that the Caribbean was modern, right? And I think that's why the pragmatism stuff mattered, because in some way you have to have a proper historical theory to place the Caribbean. And in that way, I think with Antonio's point this morning about positivism matters, because in a way what you got was the positivism of the social sciences which treated modernity or modernization not as historical, but as sociological, right? So they were all measuring things. They went out trying to look at all these indices of modernization, which takes away the historical sense of that term. All right, I'm gonna stop talking about it because I think this evidence speaks for itself. So this is, this is a study, and I'm just gonna go through You'll see some evidence of what they collect, and then you'll get to see actual text. So you get to see some of the arguments that she would take those records to make. All right, so this is one example of a question. Is it big enough? Can everyone read it? No? OK. 
Can I do anything with it? <laughs> okay. Okay, so it says, if you were not a Trinidadian, of which country would you be most proud to be no, a citizen? No, I don't And so you have first choice, second choice, third choice. You have Jamaica, United States, Russia, England, France, all these options. Oh. <laughs> Can everyone hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Right, so you have Jamaica, United States, Russia, England, France. Well, so like when I looked at this, for instance, the historian in me said, well, okay, what nations might they be leaving out? Right, because you have, for instance, others. So it just occurred to me, well, what nations would be othered in a list like that? Like how do they decide which options? So that was, that was kind of the first thing. Um, let me just give another example. Let me go back. Puerto Rico, Mexico, Canada, Cuba is there. Yeah, Cuba is here. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what might be left out. Like, what would be an immediate besides other Caribbean? But anyway, I mean, it's an interesting list to think. Right, Barbados is. Obviously, no one would be proud to be from Barbados and not from Trinidad. <laughs> Right, right, okay, so the, I'm, I'm glad that Ada raised the Soviet these Union. Are, these are Hollerus Card coding alternatives. Uh. And in other words, the first one is the full uh, 12 possibilities. The second one stops at seven. They left five alternatives right. blank. Right. right, and I'm glad Antonio said that because partly if you don't understand kind of the statistics, and the way that sociology is invested in statistics, much of this wouldn't make sense. Which is why I would warn students maybe to stay away from trying to use this for simple social historical reasons, right? For social, social history type reasons. I mean, people can do what they want with it, but I'm kind of guiding people to say that we might need something more, more critical. Um, right, so that's one example. Achievement orientation. To achieve fame by doing something outstanding and notice the categories. So again, I would say to people, when you go to the archives, pay attention to categories that they come up with. And I have a special clip that we'll see after. But when, when you read um, Zavaloni as well, she makes this intriguing claim where she says, initially we thought about mixed as all potential mixes. Negro Indian, Negro white, white Indian, but at the end, they said, well, we looked at all of that, and there weren't sufficient other mixes. So in this context, mixed only means Negro and white. So they erased the other potential mixes and something that Aisha's work. And it would be really intriguing to, to speak to right how they're classifying and coming up with categories. Um, so again, so it's Negro, Hindu. And notice again, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, colored, white. The critical point I might make here is that uh, already argues that this reproduces or in some way produces some of the discourse we think about in terms of race. So rather than necessarily interrogating it, this reproduces much of racial discourse. All right, now it gets fun. This is where we get to see what Zavaloni actually concludes. All right, so can I, do I have to read this, right? Okay. <laughs> Oh, this is gonna be fun. The Negro boy, while indulging in compensatory wishes, often includes statements which reveal his insecurity and feelings of inadequacy. Now, I'll pause here and say, like, this is one of the, the argument here, to, to repeat what Don was saying, is that the argument here is that this gap between reality and expectation leads to compensatory fantasizing. So this is, um, read, this, is, this is explaining the analysis. Um, so the Negro boy, while indulging, often includes statements which reveal his insecurity and feelings of inadequacy. And so now they quote from one of the autobiographies. Frankly, I would like to be a great person who would be remembered always, a person whose name would be used very much as Dr. Salk, Dalton, Einstein, etc. But there's always a barrier. If it is not my social standing, maybe I have not enough brains. I'm thinking of inventing a flying submarine, but I'm not very good at physics and math. <laughs> right, so that's evidence of insecurity. 
Here is another Negro boy statement. Naturally, I expect to obtain a great accumulation of wealth after leaving school, but so far it seems impossible. The only person I can rely on is my father, who's working strenuously to keep me on my legs. And this is where it gets really good. On the other hand, the overconfidence of the East Indians, which we have already observed in their narrow goals, is even more striking here. Completely lacking in the self-doubt which we find often in the Negro, the East Indian student autobiographies display feelings of omnipotence. This seems to be related to a cultural factor in Hindu ideology, which, where great stress is placed on the power of the individual will, and even great attainments are required and taught as a moral duty. And they go on. So we, we get a sense of the kind of interpretation that's happening here. All right, this one. Okay, ethnic distribution of the sample. And so they break it, Indian, East Indian again, Negro, mixed Chinese, white boys and girls. I'm gonna read the footnote because the footnote is really telling as well. So it says here, as may be expected, boys outnumber girls almost two to one in schools. Um, in a society in which secondary school attendance is confined to a small minority, girls would seem to face even greater problems in obtaining an education. In this sense, therefore, the girls in our sample, especially from the lower socioeconomic class, must be viewed as a deviant subgroup. Now, by deviant, they mean statistical, right? <laughs> but that should be a sign about the use of statistics, right? So deviant is just to not fit the average. But we know what deviant also means. All right, but now you go to the footnote to that deviance. The only exception would seem to be the Negro girls. Often the economic responsibility is upon the woman of the household, and a sharp differentiation of sex roles is lacking. To this should be added the point that low <laughs> evaluation of their skin color increases the necessity of education for these girls. As we will see later, Negro girls are especially dependent on education for any chance of obtaining more than the most menial type of job, right? So Negro girls, in other words, are saying can't marry up, right? So unless they marry up, there's no progress. So education will be critical. And this is the last one. I wanted to end on this. It's background socioeconomic characteristics of respondents. The reason why I wanted to end on this, however, was really for this. So that was initially mulatto, and it's penciled out. And it says mixed or colored. And, and one reason this intrigued me, just, I mean, uh, different reasons. The immediate one was in the age of computers, no one can tell, right? So there were still pencils. So it tells you something about the archives and pencils. So we can still see, right? If this were a computer and someone said, no, 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 take out mulatto. They don't do mulattoes in the Caribbean, right? They do mixed and colored. We wouldn't see it, right? So it's real about the archive. What we get to see is someone saying at some point, no mulatto, mixed or colored. So you get to see the clash of categories. And in some ways, again, I think it makes us recognize that these are North American researchers coming with North American categories. Right, well, although maybe Negro, Negro is kind of the term at that point. No? Well, that's, that's, I mean, I would think Negro. Right, but you know, plus this year, I'm like, anyway, we could talk about the use of Negro after, because I have an intriguing insight that I thought this year, the most important email in terms of a radical email, the one passed around from the London riots, where he calls himself an old West Indian Negro. So in some ways, the most radical statement this year, someone identified themselves as an old West Indian Negro. And I thought no one has really paid attention to that. It's like if to get respect, he had to name himself Negro. Um, all right, so I think that might be a good place. is <laughs> a, a, a good, good place to pause. But again, I just wanted to give you all a sense. You know, three things I wanted to annotate, right? Put some historical context on this research 
to tell you I think what it's useful for, and I think it's really useful for critiquing a certain Cold War imagination in the categories and the way they define the problem, and to recognize that Caribbean studies is born in that conceptualization as a problem in being modern. And so do we really, like, how much are we going to extend these assumptions? And thirdly, if you, well, if you guys go to this, I think it will just really ri yield rich research potential. And in that way, I want to say Antonio again, Antonio's work could be really instructive. So I ask people to read it and see what it means to study a study. Right, because you really have to know as much as these scholars and then to have a critical distance to see what might be some of the limits of their own work. So. Yes, it takes time. Thank you. Oh. Right. Hi, well, that's the other thing. I'm an historian, so we always look smart in hindsight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Oops. I'm one of these famous, don't know when the mic is on. Okay, we have um, uh, what we have about 15 minutes or so for uh, uh, Q&A of these wonderful, rich papers, uh, and then followed by uh, closing comments by uh, Connie Sutton and Ada Ferrer. So let me open it up uh, to the um, audience. Uh, to I, I actually have a couple of questions, but I'll go last if there's time, and uh, maybe you can be our runner if that's okay. Uh, please, first question. It's, it's not, I'm sorry, it's, I don't know if it is a comment or a question, but probably Don might have some insight in it. And I'm mostly thinking, what can we do with this source? Um, I'm thinking, what can you tell about the Wendell Bell study that was done in the in Jamaica? And whether whether there is room for a comparison or for students to, to they know that this source exists so they can go to the other. And Harvey remember the discussion we had uh, with Bobby Hill in UCLA and he said, you know, there there's people that are coming here to ask us questions about. So it was the same feeling that, that you more or less conveyed. So so probably, you know, either a comment or some insight on that. Yeah, okay, no. Um it, Excellent comment, <laughs> right? Because what you do remind, in a way, Zavaloni is doing for youth what Bell will do for the elites, right? So he goes to study elite values, and Zavaloni had done it before, right? But saying, like, I'll study the youth now because these are the people who would be leading still. Yeah, so thanks for pointing that out. They're, it's, it's, they're, they're sort of by independence. Right, right. So it's one just before, one just after. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. I don't know whether this is a question or comment or both, but uh, Don was saying, pointing out quite correctly, the, the, uh, Vera Rubin's kind of alliance with the intellectuals of the region. And the intellectuals of the region, especially the kind of left nationalist intellectuals of the region, uh, and, and the guys who built some version of social democratic independence, not other sectors of the intelligentsia of the, of, of the region. And I'm using intelligentsia and intellectuals more in the way Gramsci would have used it, not just uh, the way academics would use it. Um, on the other hand, there's, so, you know, there was a definite political orientation mm -hmm. to RISM that uh, one might find congenial. On the other hand, what you, both of you were talking about is very much the overarching standard sociology of development of that period coming from the United States and secondarily from the British as a kind of learning from, I don't know, Oceania, the masters of Oceania, or something like that, to borrow a, a model from, uh, from um, what's his name? Orwell, George Orwell. How do you guys see this? 
What are the lessons for a later bunch of intellectuals, a later bunch of academics, a later bunch of students like them? Mm. Well, I th does this work? Is this working? Right, right. Yes, sir. This works. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, Vera Rubin and others allied with a sort of left liberal intellectual trajectory. And what I think one can evaluate this is in, in a complex way. First of all, I think uh, it's, to some, it, in a sense, it's exemplary, and I you know, wanted to stress the positive of this. That is to say, uh, there is not present here any false and hypocritical intellectual detachment. There is a commitment, and this is very striking. Right? Now, uh, I, I think of a guy like Jack Goody in Ghana, and there are others. I mean, Jack Goody went and joined Nkrumah's political party in his fieldwork, and there are others who did this, right, and got expelled from Zambia by the British, or Northern Rhodesia as it then was, and so on. Uh, in other words, uh, this was a, these were North American scholars who had a certain political conviction. No, so that's one thing. I think this is extremely important for us today. Uh, they had a viewpoint, they had the ideas, they had the orientation, and they acted on it. And they paid a penalty for it in a number of cases, by the way, not in every case. Some prospered, so be it. Uh, however, having said that, by and large, the commitment was to a certain kind of liberal nationalist project, which comes out very strongly, I think, in the, in the Viva Rubin uh, Zavalone study. That is to say, you know, uh, it's a question of uh, liberal modernization. This is the boundary of what is politically and intellectually acceptable. Uh, the social forces which are driving that project are the legitimate social forces, in a sense. Uh, therefore, the result of that is that other more uh, left social forces, which do exist and did exist at the time, uh, are omitted, are erased from the picture. And that's on the downside, right? So it depends on, I guess, you know, what your own political orientation is at the end of the day. If you are quite happy and comfortable with a sort of liberal orientation, uh, more power to her, right? If you feel that this it may perhaps be slightly problematic in some respects, then of course, you may criticize it. It is in your hands, I would say. Let me, I think I'm, I'm reminded by Connie's point that we need distance because as much as I made the critique, I guess I also wanted to make it a personal critique. I think the, the deeper critique I want to make is the assumptions. And so in a way, if anything, I'd agree that the liberal assumptions, I think, is what we should look at and how it limits the possibilities, right? So it's not just the, true, they, they kind of bracket out other possibilities. And we know that communism is the great fear. In other words, I'm saying the Cold War is crucial. And the limits of, of liberalism and the assumptions, especially for the Caribbean that it creates, I think that's exactly what we need. I guess in a way, Don, I'm saying like, well, I, I, I know Don's, <laughs> Don has a great way of dismissing. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing the, the dismissal of liberal and saying like, I if that's your politics, fine. I'm sorry, I highly appreciate it. I don't know why you think I am. See, I that's, I love Don's. I think he's marvelous stuff. I mean. <laughs> I love ironic people, <laughs> right? So anyway, I just want to say that it does create I limits. Have no problem with it. It does create problem. limits. And developmentalism, I'm told. Where did you get that impression? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Some of my best friends are liberals too. Uh, why don't we take uh, uh, to in, in this for the purposes of expediency, uh, getting everybody in? Uh, Ada has a question, and then we'll take them uh, uh, one after the other, and then maybe you can answer them as a group. Yeah. First, Ada, and then if anybody else, oh, then Donette. Anybody else? And then I'll throw mine into the soup also. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe a, uh, maybe devil's advocate a little bit. I mean, I, of course, the, the question of the categories of the researcher is always critical. And as, you know, as students reading primary sources, reading anything, you have to engage in that kind of critical reading. But one of the things that I was struck with in reading the questionnaires, and I didn't, I didn't read seven boxes. I read uh, a selection mostly selected by my students in the classroom. <laughs> uh, and what struck me was that they were so open-ended that 
there were some of them were they were there was such a long questionnaire, and some of the questions seemed so random that you know that all kinds of things came out that can't of course you know they had you know they were they were they were liberals and they had left liberal commitments but in some sense the, it's like the the questionnaires are too messy but messy in a good way in the way an archive is always messy right and that what the answers sometimes transcend the categories of the researchers and so the cold war is critical right so when you talk i remember in some of the questionnaires i saw or that the students selected they would say what do you think are things you'd never like to see in trinidad and you see communism comes up a lot, but then so do other things. I can't remember now, like prostitution and some other kinds of cultural things. But then you talk about what countries do you admire? And I remember seeing the Soviet Union there a fair amount. So in some sense, I, I just think it's, it's good to remember that in reading the archive, that yes, the, the categories are important, but there are also, you can also see people kind of pushing up against the, the, the researchers' categories. That wasn't really a question, it was more of a, of a comment. That's <laughs> true, yeah. Someone over here. I, I agree though, either. The questions, the answers do. Let's hope this doesn't have a feedback. It's just a speaker here. Over this way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a quick question. I, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's try one more time. Um, OK. So I wanted to try to read the two papers um, in conversation for a moment that it offered me, and I wanted to see if you guys could give me an answer. So it seemed to me like um, in Don's paper, he was saying that the contemporary problem of youth unemployment is a result of the end of the plantation economy. Um, and yet what you provided in your paper, Harvey, is that you were, and, and, and so it, it, the impression was in the earlier historical moment, the plantation markets, broadly conceived, could, ha could house the, these various laborers. Um, and yet in your paper, you were showing that we were only thinking about 8% of the population anyway, an elite population um, that makes up the corpus of that particular study. So what I'm wondering is, looking at the two things together, how do we tell that story of youth unemployment in the earlier historical moment? Because it seems to me that that story is also there. And I'm wondering if that story is about migration elsewhere, out of the region. But I just wondered how you could put those two in conversation. Um. There is my, sorry, there's another one. Sorry, I put that one there. Sorry. There, there is actually in the. What are, are you where pointing? Are, we? are you asking? Sorry. Well, we, why don't we start yeah. and then? Thank you. Maybe somebody yeah. else. So, uh, yeah. There, there, there is interesting point. There is mention of unemployment and the danger of unemployment in some of the uh, answers. It's quite interesting actually to see it, uh, but it's not the main thrust of the answers. So that uh, this is, uh, this is. It's not quite the elite. This is not quite the elite. This is sort of the upwardly mobile. In fact, part of the whole, this is sort of upwardly mobile group. And part of the, uh, the, th the whole structure of theory which, he's do which, he, which he has is a sort of competitive status group analysis. And that this is the source of the problem. You know, they're fighting over scarce goods and spoils, blah, 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 blah. But there is this remark, which is quite striking in one of them, that I'm unemployed. Uh, I'm not sure what the future holds. It doesn't look so good, but it's not the main note in, in the thing. And what's, what strikes you is the tension that I pick up, and I have not gone to the boxes, and I perhaps never will, I suspect. <laughs> right? um, but setting that aside, what, what strikes you in, 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 the, um, in the thing is this interesting tension between uh, this sort of uh, sort of racist stereotyping of each group. I mean, this is just rabid in the stuff. Uh, across, all, you know, it's just blazing across all this, at least the material which is presented in the thing. I mean, back home, another story. Um, but at the same time, a peculiar kind of optimism is also present, you know, and she, and she draws attention to it, that people are saying, well, okay, I'm an Indian, you know, and, you know, and well, I think I will have a happy future as an, you know, as a person of Indian descent. Another guy says, "Well, I'm a, Af I'm, you know, Negro, whatever it is, and I believe that." Uh, in fact, I took out the passage. I, I perhaps will 
Why not? Why not? In the, here, here's a typical thing. In the next, I, should I read this? Why not? <laughs> this, this can be taken in two different ways. This is why I hesitate to read it. I want to read the first line and leave it at that. In the next 15 to 20 years, our small island will become a New York. There will be no unemployment. I'm not sure what the reference <laughs> there is, but nonetheless. Uh, and people will have no trouble in getting goods, like in New York, right? So, so, so there is this kind of, I mean, not to mock it, and so easy to do it, of course. Um, but there is a sort of, if you want to call it, naive optimism of the future, which is part of the theme, of, I think, of that the youth have this sort of feeling that the future, yes, there's racial antagonism and all this crap going on, but you know, I think we will sort of stumble through and there's this kind of optimism. And of course, the, true, the, the, the contrast between then and now is really sharp. I don't think you'd ever get this kind of uh, optimism today at all. What you get is not entirely doom and gloom, but a deep sense of the failure of the, or, 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 the, or the crisis, if you want to use that overused word, of the, of the um, post-colonial situation. So I think it, it, there's a sort of shift which is quite marked. It, this is why I don't know how. Yeah, I mean, just, just quickly, I'll say. Also, excuse me, this was just before this, the, the. Just before put. Sorry? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, this was done just before the change in immigration policy in the US where uh, the idea of mass, where we then experienced really mass immigration from the islands to New York City uh, after 65, yeah. right? And there, there was this other view, that brought about this other view of a future which involved going, emigrating. Uh, and they had, it had started in the 50s uh, with England, but then that clamped down and the U.S. opened in 1965 its gates and you had this massive immigration f from Trinidad as well as Barbados, which has always been a migrant society, you know, right after eman emancipation. After emancipation. Um, so I, I also want to just uh, make one, one side point. Um, and I, in, not in the RISM archives, but in Lambus's archives, which I'm going to talk about very shortly, uh, there was in the 90s a study done under M.G. Smith's on education. on education in Trinidad, in Barbados, and Jamaica. And Jamaica. Yeah. Right. And that is written up. And I think it would be really interesting. I started to read the Barbados one. It's huge. Uh, and it will really be interesting to compare that that study that was done, uh, and it's in the, this archive I will tell you about that's not here, but that should be looked at because it's a continuation of Caribbean material. Um, quick, just quickly, I wanted to add that um, the, the I, just, I want to say that the scholars themselves, why it's so much not about the personal prejudice, because when, when you read it, they actually test themselves on prejudice. Despite what we saw, there's actually a file where they are testing themselves to see whether they're prejudiced and how much anti-Negro-ness they might actually have. I mean, it's, it's really intriguing. So it tells you of a certain sincerity, which is why I'm, I want to draw attention to the assumptions, because the assumptions mean they're always asking doubtful questions. Do you think he's going to make it in 2000? Like, what's going to happen? Like, you'll see, and, and in a way, Adele said the randomness is only random. I think it becomes less random when you begin to read this stuff. Then you begin to connect, right? You begin to see that, that within that randomness, they're concerned about family, future. There are specific set of questions they really, and you're right, the, the, the respondents, they totally throw it off. And I think that's where students could benefit too, seeing how the responses mess with what they're trying to get. 
Let me just throw in my two uh, questions, one for each of you, and then we'll move on. Uh, I really uh, got a lot of thought out of both of these presentations. They were terrific. Um, my first one I'll just throw out to uh, Harvey is, you know, I, I, I thought you're, you're, what you're really doing is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, intellectual or epistemological genealogy of the way the Caribbean becomes constituted as an object of study, which is fabulous. And I love the way that you brought it back to Robert Park and the Chicago school and the marginal man as a kind of sociological project but I'm also was thinking about the other dimension of marginality here in the roughly the same time period maybe a little earlier in addition to a sociological dimension there's a psychological dimension part of what the marginal man is is an alienation not in the Marxian sense but in the psycho psych psychologizing sense, and I was wondering if you, just for further thought, because I loved your paper, um, to think about when you mentioned, uh, and I, I, you're right on the money, with the, the, the asking these young people about their feelings of inadequacy, and the, and the young man in particular that you highlighted, and uh, what's also going on with marginal, alienated, psychological uh, climate at this time in terms of scholarship is Eric Erickson and uh, his notion of the emasculation uh, uh, that comes about through plantation slavery. And I'm wondering, you know, again, if maybe if for, with further work on this, you might factor that into your genealogy because I think sociological and psychological are very difficult to uh, disentangle here. And I think that's a legacy of, a, 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 of sexuality and gender that comes out of uh, North American and Western European psychologizing in this kind of post-war, or war and post-war period. So I, I thought just for further uh, food for thought. Um, and, and I wanted to ask John, you know, uh, you have wonderful turns of phrases. You talked about a kind of concentrated, virulent forms in tiny spaces, and you were concerned with the deep inner crisis turning in on itself. And I'm wondering, those are that's real. You were referring to empirical and empirical and really troubling realities, the painful realities. But then I tried to put, I, I wanted to ask you uh, again, and if just, you know, we may not have time because I do want to give Connie and Otta their time, but uh, you know, I, I thought, let me, just for the sake of argument, I'm going to be um, Glenn Beck, or I'm going to be Fox News, or whatever, and I, I wanted to, how could we then, and this is a $64,000 question that I face in teaching undergraduates all the time, how, do, how would you present this deep inner crisis turning in on itself in concentrated virulent, virulent forms in tiny spaces without, because which, which, you're not doing this, but how do we couch these terms without reiterating the pathologizing narratives of the Caribbean, that, which also ties into you know, Harvey, because you did make, you nod to, nodded to it and you said, but I'm gonna go and talk about other stuff, because the pathologizing dysfunctionality is well known, right? Whether it's the Siamese and what's his name or whatever, uh, Moyne Commission. So I was just wondering, and it, it's a kind of an ongoing conversation. It's not a, a, a quick, you know, one-time answer. So I, I just mean it's a, a real, you, I think you raised a really interesting uh, challenge that we all have in pedagogically and politically in, uh, in the Caribbean studies. Uh, and right, so, so it, it, do we have and quick and time really to add to so that? It? If you want to come up. Oh, we don't. Yeah. No, 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 I understand that, but I wanted you to be able to be ready. Oh, from now. Too. Okay, yes. so quick no, no, please answer. Yeah. <laughs> quickly, I, um, first of all, I would want you to, to state my project for me the way you stated it next time. So if I could take you along with me, <laughs> right? Because it's really about just what you said, <laughs> the epistema, that thing. Those big words about constitution, that's it. Um, and yes, I was trying to hint, when I actually mentioned Alec Waugh and Eric Gary and Archie Singham, that's the psychological connection. And in a way, it, it reminds us that these people are in conversation with Franz Fanon and Adler. So they actually cite an Adler. So there's a way you can't separate sociology from psychology, even Herskovitz and the ambivalent personalities. In a way, and that's why I think we have to, one of the answers to jump on to Don's thing is that in some ways we have to get out of that epistemology because it doesn't allow us a way to address problems outside of pathology. Like Caribbean studies was born in pathology. That's kind of the point I would want to see. And we, we can't get away from it once we keep reiterating those terms. I 
I would hope someone would nibble on the issue of modernity. I threw it out many times, but not even a nibble. Anyhow, <laughs> um, We're sorry. But maybe on another day. Um, so much could be said on that subject, perhaps an entire symposium. Um, on the point which is raised, though, I think the two sides to this thing. One is uh, the pathologizing takes many forms, including an argument that this, there's some inherent tendency to violence in, in these populations, which you know, is a deep-rooted historical tradition of violence, which of course is completely uh, uh, um, contested by any the slightest familiarity with the statistics on homicides, because there was a time not so long ago when the actual rates were quite low. Uh, but I think there, there are two things to this. Uh, one way, which is a lesser way, but an important way, not to pathologize it, is to show the root of this violence in a certain kind of political economic relationships. In other words, to expose the social and political foundation of this violence. This is absolutely uh, uh, essential, I think. And uh, it can be done, and it needs to be done more and more. So that's one side of it. The other side of it, however, uh, and I think this is more important, is, is that this, the real storyline, it connects to what Harvey is, the real storyline is, uh, is not the oppression, but the contestation of the oppression. That's the real storyline here. Right? And I think uh, this is really why this place produces all of these crazy people, you know, Franz Fanon, and Marcus Garvey. And, uh, I mean, it just keeps going on and on and on. It never ends. What is wrong with this place? Right? And I think the, the, the explanation for it is that the intensity, this thing that I was referring to, the acuteness and intensity in these tiny spaces of contradictions which exist in every any ex exist far more and in a sense more acutely in the developed capitalist country like the United States, but because of space and many other reasons, not as acutely concentrated. You can't move away from these problems in these places which are 26 miles long. Right? So that uh, the, the, the experience, I think, principally is not an experience of, of oppression, and to tell it that way, but an experience where people fight tooth and nail against this oppression, sometimes in destructive ways, sometimes often in self-destructive ways, but still fighting. And I think once, to me, that's even more important than revealing the political and economic foundation of this oppressive system, which then turns in on itself in, uh, in tragic, uh, uh, tra truly tragic ways. So this is how I basically I, I, I grant immediately, by the way, that this is not an adequate answer. <laughs> it's certainly, again, more for us to talk about. Uh, I think we need to move to the, our, our closing comments. And so please join me in giving a very warm thank you to our panelists.